Okay, now a bunch of you are probably wondering why this is such a big deal. Um, we've got tools like Puppet out there today, which you know purportedly manage all the process. The actual answer for this is Puppet's only part of the solution for a company like ours. We deal with a grossly heterogeneous environment. Customer systems are almost never identical. We use a lot of very common material in the basic build, but we still have to customise everything for every customer's requirements. So in order to do this, we actually need a lot of glue to tie all the pieces together. Hi. Okay, so um, what we're basically talking about here today is um, we work for a company called Anchor Systems. We're a hosting provider. Um, rather than people coming to us and saying, hey, we want to have a machine, a virtual machine, on your network, and it will, has to be exactly the same as everybody else's. Well, you can go buy that for 10 bucks, why would you care? Um, what we do is we sell things where it's like, hey, um, we want a server and we want it nothing like everyone else's. So what actually ends up happening is, rather than everything being um, exactly the same, Every time we go and build stuff, it's basically a different story. Um, so rather than just going, hey, every single time, we'll just copy and paste it, like dump a new entry into Puppet, run it, it'll take five minutes. Um, instead, it takes us a bit longer. Um, so as Chris says, why aren't we using Puppet? Well, we are. We're definitely using Puppet. Our Puppet manifest is so big that it's basically sentient. Um, I better not say anything bad about it. It might be listening and send something to try and kill me. Um, so basically, Puppet is only one of the steps in the build. Um, when we're building a new system, there's actually quite a few of them. Um, for example, we're already using Pixie and D-Bootstrap. Oh, that's the, button you that's the button I didn't want to press. Basically, we're already using Pixie and D-Bootstrap. We're already using um, Puppet. That's a really easy button to press. Um, <laughs> um, again, just one step. So um, we have about 100 steps like this when we're doing a new build. And this is for the simplest type of build we do. This is before we start like building a cluster of machines for people or start really looking at tuning their databases or even touching anything like that. Um, and yeah, like I said, every time it's different. I'm just going to ignore this. Um, so basically, it used to take over a day for us to do a simple build for a sysadmin. This isn't just someone that's come in and is hitting the next button. This is someone who actually has spent years being sysadmin and going through driving existing automation, not doing it by hand, anything like that. And now it takes 10 minutes. Um, most of the time these days is how long it actually takes for Debian to install. Um, if we're running Puppet on the system, then it's how long it takes us to go through um, Puppet as well. Um, so basically, um, the way we're going here is we've got all these different systems, like we've got Puppet and all these other things like that, and we need to be able to control our existing automation. Um, I'm just going to close this, excuse me. Um, and so rather than walking through with you like the hundreds or so steps and showing how we do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through something that I have a hard time with every morning and that's getting up. Um, getting out of, um, just got to get to work, have to get coffee. What the? Um, and basically, this is something that theoretically should be really, really easy, right? Everyone could do it. Um, so, yeah, all I do is I wake up, get out of bread. I'm going to be optimistic in saying I'm making breakfast, making coffee for myself, eating breakfast, drinking coffee, walking out the door, going to work, right? Totally simple. Um, but is it really that easy? So um, when we talk about automating systems and getting a whole lot of stuff, steps running, there's a whole lot of underlying assumptions that we have. 
um, when I go, hey, I'm just going to put this um, new VM on the network, I'm already going, and I have to allocate an IP address. And I have to put that IP allocation in a database somewhere. And I have to put that in DNS. And I have to make sure it's on the right network. And I have to make sure it's on the right VLAN. Um, and when I'm sitting down and just typing this stuff, I'm doing this all in my head. I'm not even thinking I'm doing it. Um, more importantly, I'm also thinking about things like, you know, when I boot that, when I install Debian on that new system, well, maybe I should switch it on first. Or maybe it should have a network cable plugged into it. Or maybe I should make sure it's actually Debian I'm installing. And all these other things. You don't even think about this when you're building a new system, but if we're automating everything, then something's got to, because um, computers aren't quite as smart as us, apart from our puppet manifests. Um, also, we don't really do things in that order. So this is the order I went through. Um, that's all well and good if you're doing the same thing every single time. Um, the problem is, is we, rather than these lists like this, we actually start doing different steps for every single build. I'll get to like how we figure that out a bit later, but um, what it comes down to is you can't just go for every single build, here's a simple list of steps, because that list changes and we don't want to have to go through every time and saying these are the orders you should go in. Um, so if I get out of bed, then I might wake up, get coffee, make breakfast, make coffee, drink coffee, eat coffee, drink breakfast. Um, when in the first thing in the morning, like this is about how good I am at trying to figure out what order to do things in. Um, I could do it in a totally different order. I could make coffee and drink coffee before even thinking of making breakfast, which would probably make making breakfast a lot more successful. Um, and then go out the door. I don't even have to like um, walk out the door before I start drinking my coffee. Depends if I'm driving or not, you know. Um, this is a solved problem, really, obviously. Um, dependencies are a really easy way to define what has to happen before anything else. Um, as long as the dependencies are satisfied, then it doesn't really matter what order it is as long as some of them come in first. Um, so rather than going, oh, we can jump all around the place and maybe it can go this path and maybe it can go that path, all we do is we define a simple list of dependencies. So we go, it looks kind of backwards from how you'd actually do it, but you go, well, before you have to wake up, we have to get up. Um, if we want to make breakfast, first we have to get up, and before we get up, we have to wake up. Before we walk out the door, we have to make coffee and eat breakfast, too, and so on and so forth. You just go, we have to do these bits first. That's really a solved problem. Um, because I flipped this upside down, it's no longer a list of steps, and this sounds kind of obvious. Um, you don't, for example, have to make coffee just because you get out of bed. Well, really, you don't. Um, so when you're actually looking at this as more of a graph, um, it's actually called a partial ordering. What you've got is you've got a whole lot of um, items, and you're saying they have some ordering. So you don't go, this is a... Um, complete list from A, B, C, D, E, all the way down. What you're going is, well, these ones have to go before this one, these ones have to go before this one, and the rest I really don't care about. Um, and basically, that's, cool. that's um, a pretty common thing and can be really easily represented as an acyclic directed graph. All a directed graph is is where you go from one item to another in one direction. Acyclic means you can't find any way of getting back to where you were once you go down, basically. It's turtles all the way down. Um, so yeah, this is pretty simple. What this means is that we can get a whole lot of steps and we can go, right, which one do we do next? Well, which ones, if I just pick any one at random, which ones do I have to do before that? It makes it really easy to figure out what's going next. Now, what's the big deal? Like, Okay, so I've got like 10 items there or something like that. What's this got to do with build automation? Well, um, when we first started this, this was about six months ago, this was our directed graph. Um, yeah, graph is kind of died. It's bigger now. It's about three times bigger. Um, so automating this solves us a lot of time. And it, also, then you've got other things. Like, like I said, we don't do all the steps all the time. What if you really don't like coffee? Um, 
Or a different way of looking at it is if each one of those steps is something we do when we create a new build, if I'm building Windows boxes and Debian boxes at the same time with the same system, how do I tell it, oh, I don't care about Windows update on Debian boxes? Um, well, actually, it's really easy. All we do is we get rid of those steps, right? Okay, so let's say I really hate coffee. Uh, alternate universe, bizarro world. Um, what I do is I just get the same really simple graph and I go, well, these two steps you only do if you drink coffee. Now I come along um, and I'm like, well, I don't do, drink coffee, so I don't need to do those items at all. And then we remove all the links to it. And then basically it ends up looking like a much, much simpler graph because we got rid of all the things we didn't want to do. There's still like a couple of different um, dependencies here, but in reality this all falls out really quickly to just a very simple linear um, plan. It doesn't always do that, but um, as soon as we start um, culling out some of those items that we have to do, all the connections between them also get a lot simpler and a lot easier to deal with. Um, so basically, um, make magic is comes down to a couple of really simple things. All we'd have to do is, given a whole lot of things that we possibly can do, figure out what has to be done and figure out what has to come first. Um, what has to be done is basically just culling out the um, nodes that you don't want to do. Um, in this case, it's really simple, like Boolean um, ma um, pattern matching you have for every node. You go, hey, um, only with Linux, or only if not Debian, um, and stuff like that. Um, and then you define for each step, oh, this has to go before this, or this has to go before this. Make it a bit easier than having to do all those other ones by hand. Um, and there's a couple of extra configuration things, but we'll go into that later if anyone's interested. Um, yeah, actually it really does come down to three things. Um, because once you've figured out what you have to do and which ones you have to go first, something's got to actually do them and something's got to keep track of what's being done. Now, um, Make Magic is um, the part of all this stuff that just figures out what's got to be done and it also keeps track of what's being done. It doesn't do any of it itself. Um, left it a bit late, but um, I'm also going on a lot about steps and individual things to do. Um, to give you a better idea, um, Creating a new VM, say in KVM, um, or with libvirt or something might be one step. Allocating an IP address, bootstrapping stuff, running Puppet. Um, accounting and billing system records. Now, this is where it starts to be a lot more obvious with stuff you can't automate with your existing things. Um, a lot of the time, it isn't just using Puppet and it isn't just um, running scripts that you've already got because you could then combine it into one big script with a lot of really um, interesting command line things and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, we've got to associate this back to existing systems that might not have those APIs or might be not quite as trivial. Um, for example, um, with accounting and billing system records and stuff like that, not... Um, that's only one of about seven or eight different systems that we hook into to keep track of our systems and provisioning and um, things like Nagios and other sort of stuff, some of which are and a lot of which aren't actually handled by Puppet. One-off tasks like adding things into something or allocating something or figuring out where something goes, Puppet is really bad at. You can hack it around to do it, but really Puppet is more about bringing something to a consistent state, not a, I have to do this once, like I have to send an email once to a customer. Um, yeah, so setting up DNS zones, um, although you could drive all your DNS through Puppet, we don't at the moment. We use um, something else. Um, can't <laughs> okay, so, um, great, so we've got, we've got this, and we've got this thing that we'll figure out what to do and all this other stuff, but I haven't talked to anything about actually how you get it to do this stuff. Um, it used to be that we just get humans to do it. Hold on. That's really boring. I don't actually want to be a sysadmin. I want to actually, you know, automate sysadmins out of a job. It's way more fun. Um, so we get make magic, and um, you get the humans to talk to that. You go here. I want to create a new. I want to create a new web server. I want it to be pink. Um, and then make magic will figure out how to do that, and something else has got it. 
Um, so what we do is we just provide a really simple API. And then we go, right, so it's basically JSON over HTTPS, and you go, right, create a new task, call, okay, create a new build, no problem. Um, and then an agent will come along where it's like, so, okay, uh, I want to do stuff, what do I do next? And, ma and make magic will go, here, here's some things to do next. Um, Mudpuppy is one of those agents. It doesn't have to be just that. Mudpuppy is written in pure Python. Um, we use a lot of Python at Anchor and we used it basically as a really simple glue layer. What happens is for each one of those steps, we have a Python class and it goes, do this. And if it either does that or it raises an exception and fails badly. Um, and that's really simple because then we can just pull it back in and go, this succeeded, this failed. Um, there is no reason you have to do that. That's just the one we use because it's absolutely tiny and works really well. So Mudpuppy itself, just Python code. Um, so when it's doing an individual step, we might pass it off onto Orchestra and we do that a lot. Orchestra is what Chris is going to be talking about very shortly. Um, and Orchestra is a way of doing remote execution. Um, we might just call internal APIs directly. We do that a fair bit. Um, or if we can run the whole thing in Python code, well, we probably could. Most of the time we don't for various reasons. Yeah, um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hand it over to Chris to talk about the next step, which is orchestra, which is how we actually get this stuff to run on the individual systems. Um, and then afterwards, um, if you have any questions um, and aren't bored of my wall of text slides, um, then we can do that after that. So, this is Chris. He does stuff. Good morning. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about orchestra, which primarily is about doing all the things everywhere. So, what is it in summary? It is a system for managing the asynchronous execution of well-defined tasks. Now, this is actually a fairly common problem. Um, the reason why we've done it Yeah, okay, it's defeated even me now. <laughs> the reason why we've done it is we actually have some requirements that are well beyond the scope of most systems that would otherwise do this. Um, the main one we've got is actually security. Now, the large, a large variety of job execution systems designed for doing asynch asynchronous execution um, all assume everything lives inside the same security domain. We can't actually do that. Um, some of these tasks affect billing systems. Some of these tasks affect... Um, will actually affect um, administration state on shared systems or on um, authoritative data sources, all of which are uh, substantially more secure or, um, pro or um, trusted than the um, build system is. We needed multiple destination dispatching. That's another, common f that's another thing that you don't normally find. Most queue systems are oriented around the idea that one task runs in one place, whereas we wanted to be able to send tasks off to run in multiple places at the first possible convenience. And the last of our major requirements was heterogeneous environments. Very few of our systems are actually identical. Um, even the same task across the multiple machines in our environment can actually require different steps. So we needed a way to abstract that out. So if you look at how it's done, conventional approaches for this sort of thing, web applications being the, product, the typical um, implementation or um, use this case more correctly, will use some kind of shared database. They'll speak directly to the database and everybody runs out of some kind of agent which does cooperative scheduling based on the information of this queue. This has some rather nasty drawbacks. The, um, apart from the fact that everyone's running inside some, some sort of shared context or shared environment, you've also got to pull this database like crazy in order to find out if there's any new work. It's not particularly efficient and it is not even vaguely secure. Um, the tasks generally have full visibility of all state in the agent. Um, they've also, as a consequence, they've usually got full access to the database. Um, this introduces all sorts of interesting attack vectors. You can do things like diddling with the queue state from inside, of an e from inside of a task code and schedule up stuff that you shouldn't even be able to uh, mention or even modify states in the, um, in the queue to suggest that they were somehow successful in the way they weren't, change results, set things up for a man in the middle. You can do all sorts of things that you really don't want them to be able to do. 
Now, I say it's a conventional one. That's the model that's used by um, execution agents like Delayed Job and um, RISQ, which are two very popular Ruby ones. There's also very, um, very similar ones for Python, for PHP, and quite a few other environments which people have been using. Um, Java introduced um, JMS system, which resulted in the message queue uh, model, where you end up with a one-way message queue in which you pass through all of your RUM deferred tasks. However, you still don't have actually have a back channel for communication from the tasks. Tasks are generally still given the same level of um, authority and control that the application runs in in order to be able to um, perform updates out of band or out of time. At least these don't poll, these are usually event triggered. So Orchestra's solution is to in fact, do everything, everything through explicit communication. We have a big series of distinct components. We've got the conductor, which is our um, queue manager. It's the only point which actually has any real knowledge about the system. Um, and even then, it doesn't know. Um, there are a lot of, lot of things it intentionally doesn't know. Um, the you know, we have um, the, the application itself actually talks to this talks to this through a well-defined interface. Whilst I say there's an audience library, there actually isn't. Um, there is uh, three lumps of reference code which I provide, which show people how to actually talk to it. Um, even internally, the um, guys working on Mudpuppy, David and um, Jez, re-implemented the audience client from scratch. Um, it's about 100 lines of code in most languages. 10, I'm told. <laughs> so, and that's literally just you know a very simple interface to do job submission and um, status readback. The um, player is actually the, probably one of the more complicated parts of the um, process, which is a dedicated dispatching daemon. It's intended to run privileged. It is a very small lump of code. It's about 2,000 lines, I think. Um, and it handles um, handoff to the tasks, as well as, process, um, as well as making sure those tasks are isolated through a fork exec and clean environment. It also manages all the IPC to those using standard well understood mechanisms. Now the whole idea here is that every communication path is well understood. Um, when, you, when you deploy an orchestra based system, you will know exactly what your risks are, exactly what you're opening yourself up to, which was something that I needed in order to be able to, ref to actually recommend this as being the end solution. Security was the main consideration the whole time I wrote this. We look at three main points. Minimum disclosure. Information that gets passed around in orchestra is only the information that needs to be passed around. Um, ta the, all the players inside a large this orchestra system do not actually know anything about each other. They never see each other's tasks. I couldn't get that guarantee using message queue systems, for instance. And as a consequence, we have our own protocol that does this. We've got minimum trust. Every component assumes every other component is going to try to attack it. All input and output is checked. No, no, no memory space is shared. The whole environment is designed, you know, is designed to authenticate, verify, execute. Um, we never allow anyone to do anything that we don't believe they should be allowed to do. And this, you know, and minimum features again helps enforce this. We've only got a very small amount of code, a very small feature set, but that feature set encapsulates almost everything you would want to do. If you want anything else, anything more fancy like fancy dispatching or fancy scheduling, you can bolt that on the front of the system, again, as a separate component, and that should work. So how do you actually use this stuff? I've, keep, I've frequently talked about the implementation, but never actually spoke to anyone about using it. <laughs> so um, where you want to start with, um, with any sort of work with this system, you actually need to define what you're going to do with it. Now, the main components to a task are the task identifier or task name. Uh, we use a completely arbitrary namespace. Um, the only restriction at the moment is it has to be a valid file name. And I'll get onto that for, um, in a moment as to why. The task itself is implemented as a valid executable. As I said, we use fork exec boundaries to make sure that it can't actually affect the state of the, um, of the execution agent. Um, this actually offers, like I said, a reasonably good amount of security, but also means we can also use IPC, very com common IPC. Um, the system allows us to pass in arguments as key value pairs, so your task doesn't need to be fixed to one thing, and you don't need to use out-of-band communications. You can just pass your data and arguments you know, directly to the task through the queue. And when the task is finished executing, you will get back key value pairs as results. Sorry, was that a question or? Okay. To 
to make this all work, we have a little bit of task configuration, which consists of the IPC mechanism. The whole idea is that you will pick an IPC mechanism to talk to your task that suits you. Um, we've only got two implemented at the moment, but there's scope to add more. It was designed to have as many as we ever needed. And the only reason why we have two is because we do the majority of our automation in shell. So we only ever needed environment variables and pipes, funnily enough. It also sets the initial environment, the initial environment for the um, process. So we override paths, we scrub out the entire environment variable space. We know that the environment we're starting the task up is clean. And this, this is to try and reduce the number of or possible bleed through vectors from your um, application. Um, we don't want um, someone finding a way to creatively send you know, some kind of injection attack against your application. So we're going to cut down as many of the alternate vectors as possible, complex vectors, and try to keep it down, as, keep it down to the absolute minimum. Now, the actual way this is all configured, of course, is just a single file per task. It's all designed to be easily deployed via Puppet or other configuration management system. So that's how we do it. Once you've got your tasks, you need to talk to the audience. As I said, it's a really simple protocol. It uses Unix domain sockets, or stream sockets specifically. Um, for those of you who've had any experience with, with TCP sockets but not ever written a Unix socket piece of code, they're about 10 times easier. Unix sockets usually don't magically vanish because of, ne of transient network problems, and they only block if someone's not listening to you. Now, that's not going to happen in this situation. <laughs> um, the message format for the, um, pr for the actual interface is all JSON, and that was intentional. Everyone's got a JSON library now. Um, Go has an extremely good JSON library. So it was trivial to write the um, stubs for, it was tri trivial to verify, and it's trivial to implement in pretty much any language we could find. And to keep the, trans the actual operation model simple, one operation per connection, and it's polling friendly. Um, a lot of our code aggressively polls this interface, the machine doesn't even notice. Um, that's because all the status information that's used um, to respond to any JSON request is almost always in memory. So, so what's in our request? Well, we need to tell it what to run. We also talk about destinations. Destinations are the names of the players. Now, when you want to um, run a job over, um, over one of a group of machines, you still need to tell it what machines it's going to run over. If you want to run it, over, run it over all of those machines, you still need to tell it what machines you want it to run over. And that's where Scope comes in. Scope says, is this going to be a one-off task? So am I going to run it on one machine, and is that considered to be successful? Or am I going to run it on all of the machines? And is that going to be considered successful? Of course, we've also got, then got the arguments. And when you enqueue the job, the first thing you get back is the job ID. Um, but it's because this is designed for web applications. So if you're using this in a web application, you're going to enqueue your job, you get back a job ID, you persist your job ID in your session or in your database. And now every time you need to do a um, Ajax poll or something similar to find out where things are up to, you've now got this, this uh, opaque ID that you can now use to get the success information. So you can now ask the system, is it still running? Has it succeeded? Has this failed? and the result data, if there is any. Unfortunately, I've run out of slides, and we're massively under time. <laughs> so, yep. Okay, so um, that's, how you, oh, that's basically the crux of how you use it. Um, okay, um, Dave wants to run a demo, so we'll just do that. Okay, let's not stand there. Um, okay, so Chris just went into a lot of detail about like um, how he designed Orchestra and some of the things behind it and all the internals and stuff. To give you a bit of, um, bit of an idea about how hard it is to use, um, Mudpuppy, which is the agent we use for um, Make Magic, I can write three lines of code and put a sh um, one file on the server that I need to run something on, and it just works. Um, as soon as that task is kicked off, it'll run that script over there, and I ha don't have to care if it runs, where it runs, anything like that it just hooks in so seamlessly um, because he's basically already thought of that and done all the hard work um, even if I'm not doing that like I said it's a JSON interface it's like 10 lines of code to do it by hand um, just going here make it someone else's problem just get this stuff run um, so that's actually pretty cool um, what I'm going to do now is actually show off um, 
our actual production system that we use to build stuff. Now, this is actually a bit part, um, behind Make Magic and Mud Puppy. Um, we're trying to slowly um, bring it up to what's actually in the um, open source repos, but basically we have so much tie-in even before we kick off the tasks to our internal systems that um, we're basically trying to rip that apart from the system that um, all this grew out of. What happened is we built an internal system to do all this stuff, and then we were like, right, this is absolutely wonderful, and we want to kill it with fire, so how about we rewrite it from scratch and take all the best bits and ideas from that and over here, and we're still basically moving over to that. Um, so, uh, new build. so, basically, although you can now do this from like our web server just as an ordinary person with a credit card, um, what this is how we were doing it for ages, and what we give to salespeople. Um, so this is for our internal staff. Um, a lot of the stuffs for our internal billing systems and customer tracking stuff. Um, but all I'm going to do is ask it to create me a really, really simple build that's just. A Linux box. And I'll bill it to Node Pony because Node Pony is awesome and always pays his bills on time. Um, here, again, a lot of the stuff you don't really need and you can't really see. Um, and this is a whole lot of the stuff that isn't part of Make Magic because it's got little to do with it. Okay, so. <laughs> I just want to put Debian on it. I don't want to give it too much memory. Can you I don't the font size? Um, <laughs> give me a second. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Okay, um, I could add other stuff in there. And I create an order. Just scroll on Okay, and this is the slightly more interesting bit. Oh, um, green, green bottom on the window top. Oh, I can maximize things. Isn't this new technology awesome? You can tell I use Max a lot these days. Because um, this is not my Linux box. Um, basically, here's the output of that list of steps. Um, these, each one of these is something that's automated. Um, we've got things like putting stuff in DNS, putting stuff in Puppet, <coughs> getting a root password, storing it somewhere securely. That one's really fun. <laughs> um, Anyone want to know how to get a root password like generated on an arbitrary machine that you really don't trust and put it somewhere really securely when you really don't trust anything or talking to anyone and then you want to give it to a customer in some really sort of secure way so they can quickly change it? Please let me know um, because our way works, but yeah. Um, TPG. <laughs> have you tried to programmatically use GPG? Yes. Was it a lot of fun for you? That's actually what we're doing. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, basically here are a whole lot of the tasks for a really, really simple build. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to firstly tell it um, what VLAN it's on, because I'm pretty sure that's about the only thing I have to tell it today. Normally figures that out by itself, and um, you haven't taken it. it's complaining at me because I haven't told it that I'm me, and then I'll just send it to Mud Puppy. Um, so then Mud Puppy's going and creating a new server, allocated an IP address. It's done a whole lot of stuff. Um, it's currently going through the hypervisors, asking each of them, do you have any memory or disk space or anything like that? Keep in mind, this took us a day and a half before, so we don't really, we haven't optimized it so much that it takes less than about 10 minutes yet. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to minimize that so it can install in the background while we um, go and talk about other things. Um, Okay, um, so basically um, that's a brief overview of what we do. Um, 
and what we've put together. Are there any questions and is there anything else you would like to know? I'm at the man in the back in the middle. Do you guys continue to manage your systems for their life cycles? Or, or, or once it's handed over to a customer, do you cut out all your ongoing management of it? Um, the question was, is do we um, manage the systems through the life cycle or do we just hand it straight over to the customer? Um, basically, what um, man managing the systems as part of a life cycle is a lot of the services we offer. We do have a product um, at the low end where we do just hand it over to a customer, but most of what we do is actually um, server management. Yeah. Um, do you use Orchestra for that? Do we use Orchestra? Yeah. Um, no, what we actually, um, all this system is, is to get a system up and running in the first place. Um, we use things like Puppet for ongoing and a whole lot of other stuff for ongoing things. This is only a one-off, bring everything up to um, uh, like day one, get it going sort of thing. Um, So I think the question is, is that um, you've got two servers that are inter that require each other. For example, a web server and a database server um, that are, um, or a database server and a web server, or two that are interdependent on each other when they're set up and brought up. Um, the answer is is. What we'd normally do at the moment is set them up as two separate builds and then have someone go in and configure it manually because what's actually happening when you're doing that is you're talking to the client and you're going, hey, actually, um, we need them to interact in this specific way. You're never going to automate someone's own internal um, applications or anything like that. What this will do for us is set up all the databases and um, all that um, and the web servers and all the software on them so it's ready to go for that. Um, there's always going to be a level of custom setup and stuff like that. Um, although the stuff that you build on the individual machines to start with is going to be new and different, you're, we're never going to be able to automate something where someone's gone in and gone, hey, I'm Wikipedia um, and I want to install my own stuff on here um, in this specific way that you, no one else ever runs. There's going to be some sort of level of stuff and no, we don't actually host Wikipedia. Um, yeah. Um, any other questions? Um, sorry? So how are you feeding into all your monitoring systems? Obviously you've had a top of choice of there as to the types of services running on each of the you know, virtual servers that have been created. How much of that automation is then going across to the monitoring? So the question was basically how much of this is feeding into our monitoring services? Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I guess you did feed. better. Okay, um, sorry, I actually did that work. The, um, we actually can, we automatically configure monitoring for all our standard services. So if someone asks for a standard deployment of, a, um, of an Apache or Nginx install, that automatically generates a full set of monitoring configuration for all of our standard configs of that particular, you know, that particular server. Um, we, again, we can't do automatic setup for custom for um, custom tools or custom services. Um, that always has to be done manually, but in the event, like I said, that it's one that we know and we have a standard config for, we can and do automatically drop out a config to monitor that. Yeah. Yes, yes it is. Um, everything, um, so Make Magic, um, Mud Puppy, Orchestra and a couple of other things that are all available on GitHub at the moment. So if you go to GitHub, GitHub slash anchor, you'll see a link for repos for all of them. Um, you can basically download this, play with it yourself, set it up, see if it works for you. Um, one thing I will mention, um, especially because there's a couple of questions about do you do this, do you do that, um, all of this is totally abstracted. This is an example of our internal systems and how we happen to use the tools. Um, you don't need to be restricted in what you're do in what you're doing or even just for server build automation or anything like that. It's basically a way of getting a whole lot of um, different tasks um, that are all free.
for an eventual end goal and changing them around for that end goal um, and getting them all to run. Um, we happen to be using that for server build implementation. Um, what happened is we had a more specific process that was more specific to server build stuff and then we had to put in so many exceptions for individual things we actually found abstracting it another layer and just saying okay this just automates automation and figures out what has to be run eliminated three quarters of the code and 90% of the problems. So yeah. Um, I hope so. I hope it makes sense. Can you get it to produce a build document? I've been through security audits and stuff, and they said, oh, no, we must see your build document for this server. Um. <laughs> <laughs> the, question, the question was, is can you get this thing to um, produce a build document um, for things like security audits and stuff? Actually, yes, and yes, we do. We have our own internal QA and we're, um, our own internal stuff. Um, not only has the database got a record of every step, everything that may have failed, every, when it tried, who tried it, who kicked it off, um, every piece of logging information you care to send back, all in one place, but we also have a step on top of that that um, gets all that information together and posts it in our case to our own location for all our QA documents and stuff like that. Um, really, that's just one step. Um, and when I say that there's all this information available that I'm, we can pull back and stuff, that's again all exposed through the JSON API. Um, there is one step to build all the QA information and get all that sort of stuff. And basically it's going, hey, um, make magic, can you give me like the JSON file that like talks about this build that we're doing now? And it goes, okay. And then it goes, okay, let's just format that to something. Um, it's very, very flexible. Um, yeah. Um, I think the question is, do we get so far as pretty reports for security people and stuff like that? You're going to have to write your own fluff. Um, we do generate reports and we do generate them automatically. Ours are designed specifically for external security people. Um, we have a whole lot of people on staff that do that and external auditors, we would really hope wouldn't be defeated by a simple PDF. Um, I'm living in an optimistic sort of world. I've been working. <laughs> Anchor is a pretty cool place to work, right? Um, yeah, any other questions? Yeah, we've got about five minutes. If anyone else is interested in anything else? I just saw on your GitHub page a thing called Tingle. Can you give a brief mention about that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tingle was written by, actually by one of our co-workers. It's a, um, all it is a small abstraction for configuring automatic updates on most Linux distributions. question was if we've done some work with the um, programmatic reconfiguration of servers. The answer is we haven't. We actually do that manually um, in the event that we need to do it, which is relatively rare. Our environments are usually portable enough on the VM side that we can pick up the whole VM and move it. And for physical hardware, we usually just rebuild it and redeploy using the same manifests. And that works 95% of the time. Git. Sorry, um, the question was, um, well, our workflow around pup, um, puppet change management is, uh, is just literally Git. Um, we have a... Yeah, no, we... Uh, we have... Um, we have job openings on our website if you'd like <laughs> more information. <laughs> At the moment, um, we actually all we have is a automated um, automated syntax check system, um, which blocks any commit which fails. You know, verification of pretty much everything in the in the repository for against relevant syntax checkers. Um, functional review is 
basic is basically if you feel you need it, you do it. Um, most of our staff have been uh, familiar enough with the systems and experienced enough to know, you know the difference between a trivial change and something that's going to destroy the world. Um, just quickly, um, just quick. Um, uh, Um, just quickly, this is the um, system that just finished building and ran through all of this stuff and probably failed when it, um, because I didn't put a sales ticket in there. Oh no, that worked. It's saying that I have to manually create a ticket for billing. Awesome. Um, and basically it's done everything here, including sent NodePony an email saying, hey, your brand new service is just all set up and stuff like that. Um, um, okay. So um, basically, this is all ready to go now. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions before we get kicked out? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to do tend to service the same in our particular case, you'd just call us. Um, the web interface in here is quite specific to Anchor. It's got a whole lot of Anchor-specific stuff in here. Um, if like I was doing it from the command line, I would write a very, I would just put it in a for loop um, running the command line API tool to create a new server. Um, so yeah, um, by the way, the question was is like, what if I want to build 10 of these? Um, and the thing is, is basically, it's up to you. You can run a shell script to do that. You can get your own thing that talks to this API to do that, whatever. Um, And we have one brand new Linux VM, which is really quite easy, apart from the fact that it's also being monitored and is in DNS, and you too can try and SSH into it without the root password. <laughs> okay, um, anything else? Cool, well, um, thanks for listening. Just on uh,